Yeah, okay. Mm. Uh, thank you for being patient with me here. Okay, we are kind of not really tying up, but we'll step away from the series after today uh, that we've been calling God's Love Letter. Okay? And in this series, we've been trying to look at, at God's Word from different angles and just trying to um, have, get a, gain a new set of eyes and perhaps eyes that are a bit challenging on occasion uh, to look at this living Word as it comes to us in, in a variety of ways. We're going to look at the historical setting. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm, that is awesome. We celebrate with you. This love letter of God's comes to us in a lot of ways. And it's a living word, right? <clears throat> we talked about last week how we, we cannot kill off this word with a tried and true and stayed and only one kind of interpretation. And that's a challenge because we all bring our experiences to God's word and we can look at it in different ways. Today we're going to look at the, looking at uh, some scripture emphasizing the historical setting of these words and how when we look at the setting and the history how it can bring some new depth and perhaps insight into God's Word so we are looking at some scripture towards the end of the first chapter and the beginning of the second chapter of the book of James okay now tradition says that it was written by the that it was written by the brother of Jesus that James is the brother of Jesus now there are actually six different Jameses in the New Testament uh, most scholars say it was Jesus' brother who wrote the book of James, but we cannot emphatically state for sure that, that uh, the end of that sentence with an exclamation point that yes, it was the brother of Jesus, but many say it was. The book challenges the cultural belief in James' day, um, this, this belief. This was the belief that was alive in the ancient Roman Empire. That the good life is achieved through wealth and power. Imagine a society giving a ringing endorsement to the greater the wealth you have, the better your life is. Can you imagine? Seriously. There's one of my favorite movies and um, plays, A Fiddler on the Roof, right? And Teviat uh, talks about, oh, if he was rich, you know, if I were a rich man, right? He sings. And he says at one point, you know, if I were rich, if I were rich, the most important man in town would come to me, right? They would ask me for advice, like, like Solomon the Wise. And they would pose questions to me that, that, that would make a rabbi's eyes cross. And it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. Because when you're rich, they think you really know, right? <laughs> the general belief in the ancient Roman society was that if you're rich, you got to be smart and successful, and you have some insight into the, to the real secret of life, to the good life. And if you're poor, you have little to offer to society. James in his book, challenges this thought. But before we look at the actual scripture, let's consider a bit more the historical setting of his words. Rome, by the time James wrote that letter, Rome had ruled over the land of Israel for a hundred years and would continue to rule over Israel for a couple hundred more years. Now imagine, that would be like a foreign uh, enemy occupying forcibly the U.S. back in 1918, right? 
and we would still have a couple hundred more years of being under that foreign rule. That is the setting in which James is writing. Okay? In the ancient world, in the ancient Roman world, 2% uh, of the population, roughly, was said to be the elite. Okay? The elite were the wealth, the wealthy, the powerful, the privileged. And pursuing honor was the Roman way of life. Cicero, a Roman politician, uh, said that rank must be preserved within Roman society. Okay. Rank and status held society together and made Rome strong. And the levels of status were like the rungs on a ladder. Overgeneralization, but making up that top 2%, uh, we had the senators, who were very wealthy and powerful, and there were 600 senators in the ancient Roman Empire. Okay? And then you had the equestrians. There were several thousand equestrians. These were individuals who got their name, who early on, um, during the early days of Rome, these were individuals who had the wealth to be able to provide for horses uh, for, for the Roman um, army. Okay? And they were looked upon very highly because they, they sacrificed and gave themselves, but they had wealth early on. And they were simply referred to as equestrians. And the, the Curians, uh, the, these individuals were the Roman cavalry officers, and there were several thousand of them as well. These three groups made up the top 2% of Roman society. The, the other 98%, <clears throat> They were the non-elite. They were called the Volgas, meaning unwashed masses. It's where we get the word vulgar. So more than likely, we would be those unwashed masses, right? We would be the Volgas. I wouldn't say we're vulgar, but we, you know, most of us would probably make up that 98% if we lived back then. Um, most of the Volgas were slaves. Some were free. Life was structured around this kind of status, Okay. And where you stood in society obviously dictated to others what your worth was, and people simply accepted that. But Jesus comes along and says that all people, all people are of equal worth. We see that within his teachings. The predominant, predominant uh, theme is that uh, you know, he was treating all people uh, with equal worth. Uh, but that was a foreign concept in this ancient Roman society. A common saying was, the chasm between the poor and rich is the difference between a camel and an ant, okay? So if you're an ant, there's absolutely no way you're going to become a camel. If you're poor, you're always going to remain poor. You cannot go up that, that take a, a higher rung on that ladder. You are who you are. That is your lot in life, okay? Which is kind of interesting because Jesus at one point, doesn't he say in the Gospel of Matthew, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus wasn't willy-nilly in what animal he chose from the animal kingdom. He knew what he was saying when he said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And people in his day would have gotten that. Today we recognize and we preserve status and prestige in many ways, don't we? I mean, I'm just, it's on my mind now. I mean, we're going to be uh, flying out here on Tuesday and, you know, Inevitably, when you're waiting to get on your seat, you know, who gets to go on first? You know, other than mothers with kids and people who are, need some time to get on, it's those who, you know, can walk across that. In some airlines, you have a, literally a little red carpet you walk across. I've never walked across that red carpet. You know, it's almost like when you're walking by, you just want to put your foot on it once. <laughs> ah, so that's what it's like. Oh, yeah. I mean, really? The executive class, the premier class, the admiral class, the elite, the frequent flyers, whatever. I just want to get on a plane, you know. Uh, the, the ancient world also kept its status, or kept its status by the kind of clothing you wore, right? Roman citizens, and only Roman citizens could wear a toga. Otherwise, it was a crime to wear a toga. Putting on a toga, I don't know. It's, it's about as I, it was as difficult as um, trying to, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this before, like, like fold a, a fitted sheet. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, how do you fold a fitted sheet? How, how do you, I mean, really? So I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, but I bet, I bet I can put on a toga quicker than 
um, Jeremy could fold a fitted sheet. So, Jeremy, you get up here, buddy. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm going I'm to, here's, here's your fitted sheet. Good luck with this. Yeah, have you? Yeah, okay. All right, all right. You ready? Now we're going to, all right, let's, let's see. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. I need that down there further. Wait a minute. Wait. Yeah, I can I can do this. Yeah, is that pretty good? No? No, it should go over that way. I'm not. Fine, whatever. Whatever. Get out of it. Go. Sit down. Sit down. Actually, that looks really good. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't right. I would be obscene if I was wearing a toga this way. Uh, yeah, I'd be just vulgar, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's hot, too. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. The basic toga... Uh, the basic toga was called... The toga virilism. And virilism is where we get the word viril. And of course, only men could wear the toga. Okay? And only senators could wear a toga with a purple stripe down the sides. Like, oh, it's kind of sleek, you know, I have a purple slight, uh, stripe. Um, and as far as wearing stuff, only equestrians could wear a gold ring. Okay? Anyone else would be punished or beaten if you were wearing a gold ring. Equestrians were said to be in the gold ring of honor. Hmm. And if an equestrian wanted to climb the ladder, they wore a special toga. It's true. <laughs> Called the toga candida. Okay. Now, um, mm, they would adorn this toga and... It was said that when an equestrian wore a toga candida, that the air around them was fresh and clean. So the Roman saying went. And you could take another's hand when you were wearing this toga and lead him to the pr a promised land that would be sweeter. You just could. Yes, there was a song in ancient Rome that spoke such words. So give me some volume here. Right? We could make it together The further from here, girl, the better Where the, Where the air, air is fresh, fresh and clean. clean Right? Yeah! Mm -hmm. Candida. Candida Just take my hand and, and I'll lead you Where? Oh, I promise life will be sweeter Cause it says so in my dream uh, How many of you remember that song? Yeah. Who was that? Tony Orlando and Don. Yeah. 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 The ancient Romans, they rocked, I tell you. <laughs> but actually, Candida, I know, and I'm asking for a sense of humor here. Candida is actually where we get the word candidate. And can you not see politicians wearing togas? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, I could see Barack Obama, I could see the Bushes, I could see, certainly George Washington. There's actually a statue of George Washington wearing a toga. You know? I, I mean, but it, it's where you, you know, you're the candidate. And it, it's just interesting. And the toga would be dazzling white, uh, which show a purity of character. Stop it, Bill. Also in the Roman society, to help um, uh, make clear the various settings of status would be seating. 
where you sat in public and private events. It was a matter of status. I mean, today, if you get front row center at a concert, I mean, those are big bucks usually, right? Yeah. I, and I don't get why the front row up here isn't full. I mean, it doesn't cost anything more to sit up here. You guys got it. You, you all got it. Yeah, yeah. You understand. Uh, the ancient world, you sat according to rank. People knew your status by where you sat. At a Greek play, those who were of wealth and prestige and status, uh, like a senator, would actually sit on the stage um, and uh, sit sideways so you could see their profile because they were celebrities. So you went to Greek plays to see who was sitting on the stage as much as you looked at people on the stage. So, you know, so if anyone wants to come up here and look at me and show their profile, we know you are a person of importance, okay? What did um, James and John say to Jesus at one point? They said to their Lord, you know, when you enter into your kingdom, um, can we sit on your right and left hand side? You know, can we have uh, the seats of, of, of honor? Because in a banquet in that day and age, the person of prestige would sit right next to the host, to the right of the host would be the guest of honor. And the person to the left of the host would be the next person of importance. And James and John are saying, we want the right and left hand side of you, Jesus. Can we sit in those seats of position of, of, of honor and prestige so people will know we're important? And of course, the other disciples, are they happy about it? Mm -mm. Because now they're left with positions 4 through 12 as far as seating of importance. And they didn't like the fact that James and John wanted to be seen as important and prestigious. Where you sat was important in that society. Our legal system today, when it works, justice is sought. And there's no favoritism at all shown, right? In the ancient world, the Roman law was not designed for such justice. It was designed to reinforce the status that was in existence in society. And only people of higher status could drag someone of lower status into court. So if you were a person of high status and at 2%, the law existed for you. If you did commit a crime, your punishment was much less, was, uh, was very lenient compared to someone of a lower status who committed the same crime. One form of punishment that was handed down for the lowest of the low was crucifixion. It was invented by the Persians, but it was definitely um, perfected by Rome. Now, a Roman citizen could not be crucified. Crucifixion was reserved for the slaves. It proclaimed that you were guilty, that you were worthless, um, that you would be utterly humiliated before others. Crucifixion was known as, quote-unquote, the slave's punishment. It was for the lowest of the low. In this historical setting, James, who many believe was a brother of Jesus, the one who was crucified, wrote these words. Now let's look at some scripture. James wrote, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans, and widows in their, their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really have the faith of Jesus Christ? Favoritism. James is honing in on it. Treating people according to the rank, which was so uh, important in Roman society. For James, he is saying, in this community that is following the teachings of Jesus, in this community... We are going to show no favoritism. Why not? Because God has no favorites. It's a revolutionary thought that began with Jesus. To show how unique this thought, though, is, James uses a very rare Greek word for favoritism. It's only found in three other places in the New Testament. Very rare. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Um, it's the attitude of showing partiality of one person over another. James goes on to say, uh, suppose this, suppose if a person with, with, with 
Gold rings, gold rings, right? Yeah, we're just talking about equestrians. Uh, I'm just going to say, suppose if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, okay, comes into where you're assembled, uh, and then also a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes, and of course the rings, and says, um, have a seat here, please, you know, in this place of, of honor, while the one who is poor, you say, stand over there or, or, or sit at my feet. James is saying, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Hmm. James says, a man walks into the assembly, into where you're gathered, with a gold ring. Literally, literally, the Greek word for that, I'm not even going to pronounce that, means gold-fingered man. Yeah. I mean, think about that. He's walking into the room, right? Yeah. What's the name of the movie? Ah, the classic. Now, imagine this gold-fingered man comes walking into the room with that theme going on, right? And James, just imagine James is there. James would respond to that gold-fingered man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to offer you the seat of honor. Why should I do that? Because you're wearing gold rings? You know, in fact, gold finger, you'll have to be brought down by me. By me, James. James Bondidimus, right? I don't know what James's last name was, but maybe it was Bondidimus. <laughs> it's so bad. I just, it was bad. Um, this gold finger man, though, as we see, was also wearing fine clothes. Likely an equestrian, right? Well, I would have been wearing gold rings. Seeking probably to be a senator, maybe. It's a man with status who you would expect would be seated at a place of honor in that room. A person with education, a person with pedigree. But then there's this man who comes into that assembly with wearing rags. Uh, no schooling, no, you know, very impoverished. And for someone to say, just sit at my feet, was to be expected in the Roman society. But James is saying in his book, no more. It's not okay. Wasn't okay with my brother Jesus. Ain't okay with me. Okay? Then James goes on to say, chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Think, please. Uh, James says, Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? That's the Roman way, right? The rich are able to drag the poor into court. James is calling for a revolution here. This isn't, though, about God's for the poor and against the rich. That's not what this is about. God loves everyone, okay? But poverty tends to have people see their needs, and especially, perhaps, their need for God. Wealth has an insidious pull upon us to think we are in control. And as long as we have all that great wealth, we're going to be okay. Wealth can blind us, okay? That's a great danger in it. James <clears throat> is really making the case. You are showing special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and the gold rings. I don't know about you, but when I'm wearing nice clothes, you know, a suit and tie, I do tend to be treated differently than when I wear something like this, when I'm out. In, in, and it's just interesting. And I think that's the power of clothes. It really is. It's like, oh my gosh, boy, that person must be having a hard time. Look at what they're wearing. Oh my gosh. You know, and we, we make quick assessments and judgments about them. And I'm amazed at, at how different people treat me. I don't know about you, but when I wear that, that tie and I become sir and, I, and people, I, 
It's kind of sad. I mean, I like wearing nice clothes, but I love this more. I love being comfortable. I'll choose that any day if I have a choice, this over a suit and tie. Okay, but that's me. That's just me. James is trying to get at, where is your attention going? You know, are you trying to, you know, hobnob with that fine clothed man? Or are you willing to care and reach out and have a relationship with that person in rags? It's not accidental where our attention goes, okay? Part of our nervous system, I mean, this is even chemical and, and, and biological, part of our nervous system is called the reticular activating system. And it helps our brains to direct where our, our attention goes. We tend to draw attention. We, we get attention where our mind is going. It's very obvious. I mean, but think about it. Like if you're looking to get a new dog, like a poodle, suddenly you see poodles everywhere, right? Or you're getting a new car. Suddenly you see that Nissan that you want to get. It's everywhere because your mind is in tuned to looking for that. Well, sin has gotten into our reticular activating system. Okay? And we tend to see, perhaps, that beautiful person, that rich person, that successful person. Funny thing about clothes, we really tend to notice them, don't we? It costs a lot to have nice clothes. It costs a lot to keep them clean, too. <clears throat> Back in the late 80s, um, on my day off, uh, I would go to a family shelter in Alexandria, Virginia. And I would work there with the families. And one day when I left, I went down about a half block away there in Alexandria to a laundromat. And I went there to help a little. And what I did was I just randomly paid for people's loads of laundry. And back then, I think it was like $3 for a load. I don't know what it is today because I'm privileged. I have a washer and a dryer. I don't go to laundromats, right? I'm in that top 2% in some ways. And I was asked, you know, why I was doing that. And I said, just because. Just, I just wanted to. And one woman said, are, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. And she turned back to her friend. She said, see, I told you. I knew he was. And I never thought much about it, but if Jesus came to our world today and he had a choice on a Sunday morning to hang out at a laundromat or one of our churches, I don't know. Where do you think he'd find them? Kind of wonder. Hmm. You know, maybe, and it got me thinking. I know we have that Acts 2 Sunday every so often here at church where we go out and do acts of service, uh, cleaning the green belt or painting or whatever. I'm thinking maybe we need to have a Be the Church Sunday. Rather than go to church, be the church. And we come here for you know, a prayer, uh, maybe communion, a song. We head out, and we hit the laundromats, and we hit the Walmarts, okay? We hit the fast foods, and we randomly serve people or families uh, financially or with our time. I mean, I can just envision us going to Walmart, getting a pack of gum, and finding someone who's there with a bunch of groceries um, ready to check out, and you get behind them, and they say, no, get in front of me because you only have a pack of gum. You say, nope, nope, nope. In the meantime, you just talk with them during that time, and then you pay for their groceries. And, of course, pay for your pack of gum. Don't walk out without paying for that. <laughs> but wouldn't that be sweet? Oh, my gosh, what an act of service. And that would inspire that, that person that you know, there are people in this world who are just downright good. Mm. And you wouldn't have to talk to them about church. Just connect with them at a human level. Care about them. Love them. If they bring up church or Christ or whatever, great. It'd be kind of awesome to do, have a Sunday like that. Being a Christian is enough. You don't have to go spout out about it. Just live it out. Which leads us to these words in James. What good is it, James writes? Uh, writes, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works, can faith save you? Is a brother or sister, if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily ne needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, it's dead. So do we really believe what James is saying. 
what does it mean to really believe something? Often we say we believe something, but, but then we really don't by how we don't live it out in our lives. I mean, look at these words. And they're beautiful words from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Those are beautiful words. They really are. And I weep over how we've fallen short of saying we believe in those words. I mean, even Thomas Jefferson, who authored those words, fell short of them. At one point, he owned over 200 slaves. Throughout his life, somewhere between 400 to 600 slaves, scholars say. And I cannot in good conscience apologize for him, saying, well, that was the society he lived in. That it was a slave-based economy. A human being bought and sold and transported like cattle is an abomination in any era in human history. I'm not apologizing. Thomas Jefferson could not have believed his eloquent words because he really did not live them out. Oh, he wrote beautifully about it, though. He used slaves as collateral to help rebuild Monticello in the 1790s. Abolitionist Moncure Conway, noting Jefferson's enduring reputation as a would-be emancipator, remarked scornfully, never did a man achieve more fame for what he did not do. That's from a book entitled The Dark Side of Thomas Jefferson. Our behaviors reveal what we believe, and I know I'm guilty. Okay. I, on a lighter note, I mean, when I went skydiving a couple years ago, when I was up at 16,000 feet, I really believed it was safe until I stepped out in that wing. It didn't feel normal. Okay. And for a moment, I, I could just picture my body smashed on the ground, my children without a dad, my wife dating much younger and more handsome men, <laughs> and you guys getting an amazing pastor who can preach an amazing sermon in less than 20 minutes. Sorry, I'm not going up on the plane anytime soon again. <laughs> Sorry, you ain't getting rid of me that easy. I believed it was safe, but when I stepped out on that wing, it's like my blood pressure told me otherwise. So there are really three levels of belief. Well, oversimplistic and generalized, but the first is uh, the belief, those who claim to believe something but really don't, Okay. It's called manipulation. Oh, yeah, I believe that. You know, politicians sometimes are known for that. Uh, religious leaders are known for that. And then there are the core beliefs. I think I believe, but it turns out I don't. I really thought it was safe until I stepped out on that wing. No, 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 I, I don't believe it's safe. And that third level, the mental map that's ingrained within you that believes about how things really are. You know, you don't ever violate that mental map of yours. It's like the belief about gravity. You navigate your life around that belief that, yes, gravity is a real thing and it really has impact on me, and so I will maneuver through life knowing that. It just becomes second nature, right? As I almost step off the step here, I would experience gravity there. That's the kind of belief that James encourages us to have in Jesus. It's just second nature. It's part of who we are. And it will guide us through our lives. So James, once again, makes, wants to make it real clear. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, do you really have the faith of Jesus Christ? Do you really have that belief? Do you? James is emphasizing having the faith of Jesus rather than having faith in Jesus. Both are essential. James is all about living the faith of Jesus Christ, not merely believing in it's a faith that is relevant for today yes have faith in jesus but also have the faith of jesus a faith that refuses to dismiss anyone based upon their socioeconomic status or their, their politics or their ethnicity or their gender it's a faith that embraces Jesus' mental map, that God is with me and watching over me all the time, that the Lord, my Father, is my shepherd. It's a faith that proclaims that every human being is worth you going to the cross for, to sacrifice for. The good news is not just for me, it's just not for you, it's for this world. 
and especially in many ways for the poor and the orphan, the disenfranchised, the trafficked, the hungry, the bullied, the refugee. So it's like we need to go to God. I'm winding it up here. It's like going to God saying, here, God, here's my bank account, okay, that you've entrusted me with. How do I give? Okay, God, here's my time. How can I serve? Okay, God, here's my heart. How do I love? Oh, how our world is waiting for those who don't merely have a faith in Christ, but have the faith of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your son, the most beautiful gift that this world has ever received. And oh, how we believe in him. We long to. It's just that our lives sometimes betray us and our attitudes betray us. So we ask for grace with each other, that we help each other, that we not turn our backs on each other when we fall, but we help each other up and truly hold each other accountable to believing not merely in your son, but having the faith of your son. It's in his name, in his spirit we pray. Amen.